Joining us right now on the line, we love it because every week we get some dirty dining. There's not a lot of dirty dining to talk about these days, but Darcy Spears from ABC 13 joins us. Darcy, how are you? Hi, I'm doing great this morning. Thanks, guys. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit uh, first. I mean, have you been doing any dirty dining? Uh, is there anything going on as far as that's concerned? Because as you know, a lot of these restaurants, I shouldn't say a lot, but as you know, some of these restaurants are still open as far as to-go orders. Uh, anything new on that home front? Well, there, you know, the restaurants that are and continue to be open for curbside pickup, delivery, uh, to-go orders, you know, they're subject to health inspections, just the same as if they allowed people to come in and dine. You remember, they use kitchens to commercially prepare their food for the general public. And so while the health district, you know, works to ensure that there are strong public health measures in place to respond to COVID-19, part of those efforts are to inspect the places that are open for uh, takeout, curbside, and delivery. And they're not always keeping clean, and we continue to find that to be the case every week, including this one. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And I have also have no doubt when things begin to reopen, you're going to be back at it again. But uh, I wanted to ask you we'll a little back, bit about yeah, uh, yeah, but for now, we're online. We just aren't going into the restaurants to ask for, you know, people's comments like we typically do. So the broadcast version of it has been scaled back to respect uh, the social distancing guidelines and the shutdown and the stay-at-home stuff. So we're, we're getting the information. The records are there. We're speaking to restaurant owners when they agree to speak with us on the phone uh, and putting that stuff out there digitally. So the information's still there for you. Gotcha. We appreciate that. You do a great job at that. I wanted to ask you a little bit about antibody testing because you did a story on this, investigating this. Uh, antibody testing, uh, you know, is remaining hard to find in Nevada. And, and some of this testing shows that, you know, if, if someone, uh, someone's been infected. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? What did you find out? So antibody testing and what could come from that, which is potential convalescent plasma donation, is kind of the next step as we move toward the rebound and reopening. There have been a lot of antibody tests um, that are already out there produced by uh, private organizations. Um, but earlier this week, the FDA changed previously relaxed rules to make antibody test approval more stringent after they realized that self-regulation resulted in inaccuracies on those antibody tests as high as 40 percent across the country. So, you know, people may have been able to go to a private lab and get an antibody test, but an Prior to this week, when those federal regulations changed, it's unfortunately very hard if the test that you got was reliable. The health district just started talking yesterday about its plans to roll out antibody testing, which they told us they hope to have rolled out in the next week or so. UMC is going to start doing it on May the 30th. Um, UNLV has a partnership going with uh, Vitalant and with UMC to start doing reliable antibody testing. And we're told by the health district that this stuff is going to be between 95 and 99 percent accurate. So the important thing to know there is that antibody testing can tell you if you've been infected, but it can't tell you when you've been infected. And they're right. also they don't yet know how long the immunity will last in your system. You know, are you immune to get it again for a couple weeks, a couple months, you know, forever? There's still so many unknowns. Um, and I know a lot of people who believe that they were sick much earlier. You guys are probably aware that we did that earlier coronavirus timeline story where the state did confirm what a lot yes. of people suspected and that, you know, the coronavirus was here in Las Vegas before that March 5th first positive case. So yeah. a lot of people who feel like they they had it before then and want to get those antibody tests may learn that they did in fact have it, but it also might not correlate with the fact that they felt sick. They could have been super sick and had something other than COVID-19 and not had any symptoms of COVID-19 and still get that positive antibody. So there's, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns in the medical community. But once these reliable tests start rolling out more frequently, at least people 
will have, you know, some knowledge, hey, I have this, I've got some immunity of some sort in my system, you know, and then a lot of folks, of course, want to be part of the solution and take the next step, which is go through the process of being qualified to donate convalescent plasma, because right now that is really the the only um, FDA-approved antibody treatment available, and people who are really sick in the hospital and get this convalescent plasma transfusion are getting immune-boosting antibodies that some who've been sick and received it say is, is what they believe saved their lives. Well, another thing that it does is it lowers the, the mortality rate of the virus. Obviously, if, if you if you had the virus and you survived, then you, know, you didn't die of it, and obviously it becomes less deadly. There was an article that came out about a man from Texas who was at CES in Las Vegas, and he actually was tested for antibodies at some point in, in the last month or so, and he, and he was confirmed. He, well, he claimed that he had the exact same symptoms uh, that, that you know your standard COVID-19 patient has uh, directly after CES. He even described... Uh, there was there was one particular room there where it was it was I think it was, it was at the airport, but it, they called it the CES flu. I guess there's, it's pretty standard for people to get very sick after CES, but this was a very severe CES flu under these circumstances. There was also a uh, a dermatologist named H. L. Greenberg who actually had, he had he he believed he had symptoms in mid December, and he went to Quest Diagnostics. And he got. We actually had him on the show last month on this Monday, but he, and he got tested for antibodies, and he was tested positive as well. So, and I and my, myself, I was I was sick in January. I was told that I had pharyngitis, then strep, then bronchitis. It, it, it was it was a, a, a cough that was very very deep down in my chest. So I, I think that a lot of people in Las Vegas have have most likely been exposed to the virus. Have you heard about both of those stories as well, Darcy? Absolutely. Um, Michael Weber is the gentleman from Texas who was a CES attendee, and we spoke with him. Um, We included the information from that interview in one of my earlier stories. Uh, In my piece that aired last night, we had a couple. The husband is a convention teamster who worked on the Samsung booth at CES. He got super, super sick right after that and gave it to his wife and talked about coworkers. He said one of his coworkers uh, was coughing so hard that he actually broke capillaries in his eye. Wow. So, excuse me. So, yes, there there are certainly, and the CES flu is called the CES flu because this year's not the first time that people right. get super sick af- during and after that convention. You know, the environment right. is a germ pool no matter whether there's coronavirus or not. Um, but certainly a lot of people who were sick around that time, and keep in mind that's also flu season. Um, right. A lot of people do, in fact, believe that they had COVID-19, and we know that that earlier yep. timeline exists. Um, but again, going to get tested for those antibodies isn't going to tell you when you got sick. Darcy, I, I want to uh, change topics real quickly. Another story that, that you, you did a great job on, and that is pandemic speeders. Now, I can speak personally for myself. I think some of the worst drivers in the country are right here in Las Vegas, but I think this <laughs> gives them a reason uh, to say, well, maybe the cops aren't going to pull me over for a ticket with everything else, the open roads, everything else that's going on. Me personally, I've seen what you saw, and that is people taking advantage of this pandemic and, and, and driving way too fast, not even on the highways, but on some of these side streets. Tell us a little bit about what you found. So that's a real issue, pandemic speeders, not only in Las Vegas, but across the country. People are taking advantage of the open roads. They're going way, 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 way too fast. You know, the stats we got from Metro and from Nevada Highway Patrol show just speeds well above 100 miles an hour. People are just zooming out there. And it's not that law enforcement isn't paying attention. In fact, they are. And the people who continue to, to flout the speeding laws and not only put themselves, but a lot of other people in totally unnecessary jeopardy, you know, are forcing the interaction between themselves and police and troopers because they they have to keep tabs on this. Um, but it's a really serious situation. And the takeaway from this is that the the accidents that excessive speeding creates are completely and totally preventable. And, you know, we're, what are you in such a hurry to get to? There's nowhere to go right now. So there's been a, a lot of more drunk driving arrests, a lot more incidents, um, uh, crashes that the police are having to respond to because people are out there breaking the law kind of just because they can. And it's not okay. 
No, it's definitely not okay, and I'm glad you're exposing some of these people, and uh, and uh, it, it's terrible. With everything else that we're having to deal with when it comes to this coronavirus pandemic, uh, we shouldn't have to deal with uh, dangerous, more dangerous drivers on the roadways. Uh, Darcy, always appreciate it when you take the time to come on with us. Can you give us a little bit of information on uh, some of your stories when they air on ABC 13? So you can find me typically, my stuff's been airing um, at, in our 6 p.m. newscast, but a lot of a lot of the stuff that um, a little bit more of the special report style things, um, you can catch those first thing in the morning at 6 a.m. and then again at 11 a.m. in our midday show, and then they rear at 6 p.m. So we're making those stories available to folks throughout the day parts since we know people are, are home and watching news at different times. Um, once again, on the dirty dining front, you won't see that on the air at 11 right now like you typically do at 11 p.m., but it is online at ktnv.com. Just published a new one yesterday involving a mom's teriyaki and an AM PM mini mart. So that information is out there at ktnv.com where you can also always find any of my stories that you may miss on television. Mom's teriyaki. I look forward to hearing all about that. Darcy, <laughs> you mean you sounds interesting. Yet? Come on, dude. <laughs> not the mom's not the mom's teriyaki. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I haven't. Yeah, no, yeah, I so haven't. Tell us about well, it. Mom's yeah. Teriyaki is a little place on Jones and Sahara. And interestingly, the manager who I spoke to, really nice guy, told me how big a fan he is of Dirty Dining and that he never thought that he'd be on, <laughs> you know, on the show. Oh, that's so, awesome. <laughs> you know, but it, and he explained to me the the main issue with their kitchen is that it was really dirty and really greasy and that the health department was concerned that there was going to be a potential pest infestation as a result of the conditions. And he explained to me that because of the pandemic, they've had to let almost all of their staff go. And it's just him and his mom that are working 14 to 15 hours a day to make ends wow. meet. And they admittedly fell down on the job when it came to cleaning the kitchen. And, you know, so it's kind of a balance. You know, you feel for these restaurants that are out there trying to maintain livelihood. And I'm sure it's a tough balance between filling to-go orders and keeping your kitchen clean. But you've got to do it. And it is, you know, and he said that he takes full responsibility. He was really disappointed um, in the way things got, noting that the restaurants had only A grades for the past four years up to now. Um, hopefully, you know, he believes business is going to pick up here soon enough and they'll be able to rehire some of their staff. But when you look at the pictures and they're all posted at KTNV.com, you're going to see some pretty dirty and unsanitary and unappetizing <laughs> conditions in there. And then the AM, so AM, which is on Charleston and 4th Street, uh, they keep failing their reinspections. They've got an infestation of flies, sewage backup. Ooh. Maybe not, not, not the fly guy. you want to be shopping at right now. AM, PM. So what are there? Are there flies in like the egg salad sandwiches? I mean, ooh, that's. So what are they doing? They're well, just yeah, flying I around. Mean, <laughs> just buzzing, just buzzing around. This is they're they're buzzing the place. Yeah, it's it's funny because inspectors reported they saw approximately sixty five flies flying wow. around and landing on walls and surfaces. You know, and I'm like, you can really count sixty five flies. I guess you know. That's impressive. I don't know. Miss yeah, how do you how do you do that when when they're crossing each other flying around all like that? That that's I nuts. I don't know. That's Maybe a impressive. lot of them were landing on the food or something. Oh, I don't okay. know. If somebody that if somebody walks in there with an EBT food stamp card, are they allowed to purchase flies? Are they? I wonder if they're not covered. Yet. I wonder if they're covered under food stamp. I don't know. That's that's an interesting one. But uh, anyway, yeah, Darcy. not yet. I mean, you know, you call it a source of protein if you want, but. You know. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So I wanted to. I wanted to ask you, considering the circumstances, you know, of of the the guy at Mom's actually being a fan of the show. Did you take it easy on him and his mother's business, as far as you know, the demerit scale goes? Surprisingly, most of the people we speak to when we do dirty dining tell me they're fans of the show. Um, really? They they watch it. They appreciate the education. So he's not value. special. No, no, it's definitely not the first time I've <laughs> heard this. It's nice to wow. hear it because, you know, even though it's it's a negative for the restaurant, the industry itself, we like to feel like we're partners with them in a way where, you know, we're all interested in protecting public health. You got to be called on your you know what when you're not 
living up to right. your end of the bargain. And they appreciate, sure. you know, the public service journalism that we provide when we do this segment. So he's yeah. certainly not the first person who said he's a fan of the show, but it does typically lend to them being willing to talk to me and explain themselves. And that right. helps a lot to get that perspective. So it's, you know, the viewers have a full yeah. picture. On a, on, a, on a side note, I don't think anybody is seeking you out and emailing you from any of these restaurants saying what a big fan they are and they hope to star <laughs> they hope to star on your show, on your reports. I don't think I don't think we see that happening, but at the same time it's nice to know that they appreciate what you do. So I, I think that's a testament to you. Darcy, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Please stay safe, you and your family, and look forward to catching up with you again next week. Thanks for coming on. Thank you both. Stay healthy, everybody. Absolutely. Lot, there you go. That is uh, Darcy Spears. Great job she does for ABC 13. That actually turned into a Dirty Dining segment. That was awesome by accident. We made it work. Live radio.